basically, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is the last tutorial for today. Uh, my name is Miloš, I'm the project managing assistant. Right now with us is Przemyslav and he will be giving a talk or a tutorial on how to use Julia for your next scientific computing jobs. The Julia is a new open source language designed for science data analysis. And um, just a quick reminder that tomorrow is the, after this, the tutorials are ended for today. And tomorrow is the program part with talks that you can attend virtually. So basically, Przemyslav, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So today I'm going to tell you how you can use the Julia programming language for your next scientific computing job. Uh, I am an assistant professor at SGH Warsaw School of Economics. I'm also an adjunct professor at Ryerson University, Toronto. And I'm also a managing, a managing partner in a, a venture capital fund that is specializing in investing in companies that focus on data science. Uh, so uh, this is it. This is, this is the presentation. So something, uh, something more about uh, myself. Uh, so, okay, I already, saw, uh, I already told where, where I do a work. What technologies I um, particularly know, it includes also Python, R, Java, Bash, and several other programming languages. So you can ask me any interrelated questions. Uh, I'm a co-author of the Julia books. Uh, I also held the third place on Stack Overflow answering Julia questions. And I, sip, I and I specialize in many data in many data science uh, in many data science related areas. Okay, so this was about myself. So the first thing you need to do, you need to install the software. So you have received the installation instructions before the workshop. Although if you have not installed the software, this is uh, you still can participate and you can still listen to the presentation. The slides and the material for the workshop are available as the website. So this is the this is uh, this is the address, and if you go to this website, uh, you can actually um, you can actually uh, see the see the materials. Uh, you can download these materials. By the way, this presentation will last around 90 minutes. Uh, you are also warmly invited to ask questions at any time. So the materials are available as the slides. So, so some of the discussion will be just taking place in the console, as well as the materials are available as Jupyter notebooks or HTML versions of those notebooks. So if you do not have Julia installed, but you want just to have a look at the results of executions and maybe you want to follow me in my explanation on how Julia works, you can just open, uh, you can just open the HTML, um, uh, the, an HTML version of Jupyter Notebook. So everything is here, everything is online. So you can easily follow me anyway what you are uh, going, we are going to use. Most of the examples will be run in Jupyter Notebook, which is available from Julia and they can be run uh, from Julia. But also I'm going to so show some examples in Microsoft Visual Studio Code. I'm actually using an open source version of Visual Studio Code, which is called, uh, which is called VS Codium. Okay, so this is uh, this is this is the tooling set. The Julia itself can be downloaded. Also, the installation instructions are again available on the website for this uh, for this tutorial. So the first thing any journey with Julia starts is the Julia command line, and Julia has a very powerful command line. So let me. Let me start a command line and let me type Julia. So suppose my Julia, um, suppose my Julia is installed. So here is the welcome screen for, uh, for Julia. A, a very distinctive feature of this programming language 
is a very powerful command line interface. Namely, the command line interface has many nodes, modes. So the standard mode is when I can execute any Julia command and whatever I need to compute, this is going to happen. But then if I press the square bracket, I'm moving to a the package manager mode. Uh, so now what actually I can do, I can issue the comments to the package manager rather, rather than to Julia, to, to Julia. So for example, I can ask about the status of installed packages. And hey, I'm seeing the status of installed packages. I press backspace to move to the normal command line. Another command line is the bash command line, the shell command line. So here, now I can insert in a bash command, say ls minus minus li, and I'm seeing the contents. Uh, I'm seeing the contents of my folder when I have all the files for Julia. So you can see this is just a bash command this time. Again, I press backspace to get out of this. Now, another mode is um, help mode. So I can press question mark and I can ask about any Julia function. So I could type something like a println and then I'm getting the help for println. So when I press this question mark, we move to the, uh, we move to the, um, uh, to the interactive modes. Now there are many other modes uh, for the Julia command line. So you can see so far that so we can open the package manager, we can run shell comments, but actually new can be added. Uh, for example, Julia um, has an integration with the R programming language that probably uh, everybody of you knows about R. And actually, if I load a package that provides the support for the R, R language, then suddenly, in the command line, I could also issue an R comment. Uh, so it takes some time to load because it's loading full R in the background. So it will, in few seconds, it's uh, this, this comment, uh, in few seconds, this uh, comment should be completed. And then now when I press, press the dollar sign, I'm able to issue an R comment in Julia. So I could write something like C, and create an under R vector and add four to this vector. And you can see this is, uh, you can see that this is actually, uh, you can see that this is actually going uh, to work. So something has blocked on the console. So this is always the big disaster of demo. So something, something is still processing. But I can, uh, oh, okay, it went through. So I can execute, as you can see, I can execute any R command. So I pressed type C, one, two, three, four. So I created an R vector, added four to the vector, and I'm getting the result. And everything is happening in a single console. So this is a very strong multi language console. You might also ask questions can I? issue a Python command. And also, yes, this is true. It is also possible to issue Python's comments from this console, although Python is integrated slightly more natively and with Julia and uh, this will be in the minute. So this is a kind of a glue environment. So in the Jul Julia command line, you can do everything at what place. And this is something very convenient. Okay, so this is about uh, this is about the command line. So here are more comments. You can add and you can install any Julia package. So you have an add command the, and the add command will install any Julia package. Of course, you need to go to the package manager. So you press the square brackets, then you see something like the package manager and then you can issue commands to the package manager. This is how you install the Julia packages. In the in manual for this tutorial, you also have had some information on how to install the packages. Okay, and here are some more examples. So here's the status of my process of installing the Arcle package. So sometime before the lecture, I this, this I, I have installed the R package, and here you can see the installation log. The package manager in Julia is really excellent and very powerful. 
it works in many ways more comfortable than the was equivalent in R or Python. Okay, we are going to work most of the time, maybe not all the time, but most of the time using a Jupyter notebook. So there is a package for using Jupyter notebook. This is called iJulia. Now, this time you have here an example on how to install package programmatically. So I've shown you that there is a package manager, but any command you execute via the package manager, you can just do programmatically, of course. So, uh, so you have programming language comments to installing all packages. So this time we are going to use the Jupyter notebook. This is using iJulia and this, here's the comment. By the way, maybe not so many people know that Jupyter in the main name of Jupyter stands for Julia Python R. So actually GU in the name of Jupyter stands for Julia. So these are the three basic languages that the Jupyter notebook was invented for. Okay, so let me let me try to load this package. So I'm loading I'm loading the package iJulia, which is uh, which is used to spawn a Jupyter notebook, and now I can execute the notebook command. I also want to provide the location of directory when I'm going to work. So I'm currently in my files with all those tutorial Jupyter notebooks. So this is the directory I'm going to provide. Okay, so now it is going to, to uh, what's going to happen. The Jupyter notebook is being started, and very soon, in a few seconds, uh, we are going um, we are going to see that in the web browser. So you can see this has opened the web browser, and this is the Jupyter notebook for today's tutorial. Although, as I have said maybe not of all of the time we will be using only Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so this is the first piece of code. You execute this by standard by pressing, of course, by pressing, of course, control enter. And when we execute it, we are going to see the version of Julia. If someone of you runs this tutorial at a different Julia version, so I'm using the latest version as at the time of this recording, which is Julia 1.63. But if you watch it later, or maybe, or maybe uh, you have already some other version of Julia installed on your machine, you can always click here, change kernel. So there is a kernel menu, change kernel, and choose the Julia version that is actually installed on your machine. Okay, so this is this this has been configured to run with Julia 1.63, but should you have a different Julia version on your machine, just go to the kernel options, change the kernel, and choose whatever and choose whatever you need. Uh, so you can see here is the status of my machine. So this is the basic information version info is the basic information on uh, uh, my machine. These are custom settings for the locations of Julia folders. You will not see that on your computers. This is uh, for my convenience because I'm running many Julias on my machine. You can actually execute not only Julia commands like the one here. So this is a Julia command, but you can also execute package manager command. So I have told you that there are many types of command line and uh, you can also switch to types of command line via Jupyter Notebook. So like a similar, a similar like you have a magic characters uh, in case of Python. So here I'm changing to the package manager and executing the status command. And here I'm changing to the bash and executing a bash command. Okay, so this is so this is actually how it uh, so this is actually how it works. Okay, so we have started the environment, and uh, the first thing we might ask uh, ourselves: Why the hell we need another language? So we know there are plenty of programming languages, hundreds of them already. You have practically a programming language starting with every letter of the alphabet. Why the hell we need another language? And this is perhaps the first thing you need to understand between uh, before you start learning. So this is the problem that the Julia claims to solve. So in case of scientific computing, in case of data science, you have something that is called two language problem of data science. 
you use one of the language as a glue and another language to implement compute intensive algorithm. Think about Python and NumPy. So NumPy is written entirely in C++. If you want to change something in NumPy or add similar functionality, you would need to use C++. And Python is performing just the glue functionality for NumPy. Similarly, all her performant libraries in R are implemented again in C. They are never implemented in R. Why? Because R is something like two orders of magnitude slower than C. So it would be just not appropriate for this kind of production libraries. So you can clearly see that this is a problem. Uh, maybe we are just using language for very basic tasks. You do not worry about it. But suppose you want to implement your own library. Suppose you want to implement your own algorithms. Then there is a problem because then suddenly you live in your Python world but you need a custom algorithm and then you end up writing it this in C. So suddenly your code is written into languages. So this is something that Julia is, uh, is promising to solve. Namely, here are the four popular ecosystems for data science. So we can have one based on R, on Python, on Julia and on MATLAB. The point is that hot code in languages such as R or uh, Python needs to be written by in C. In Python, you have though some libraries such as Numba and Cyton, uh, but if you have used them, you know that they work not so easily when the code is big and complicated. And not to mention the GPU. So suppose you want to compile, you run your Python code in GPU, then very often, you need again revoke uh, to see. Although there are some, some libraries for uh, uh, Python-based uh, GPU program. Nevertheless, in case of Julia, it you can use it for glue code because it has very nice Pythonic syntax that you are going to see very soon. So it has syntax between Python and MATLAB. So you can very conveniently use it for gluing the code, but you can also use it for hot code because Julia compiles to assembly, okay? So Julia compiles to assembly and then it can be used at very efficient code. Uh, so Julia is as, uh, as fast as C and we'll, uh, we'll discuss that in a second. And last but not least, Julia can be also natively compiled onto GPU. So again, you have a one, one language and you write the code in this language and it can get compiled to CPU, but as well, it can get compiled, it can get compiled to GPU. Uh, another alternative is MATLAB. And I would say this is probably the biggest competitor of this programming language. And yeah, so what is the problem with MATLAB? If you run huge scale installations, MATLAB can be very expensive. So I've been talking with a director of a big supercomputing center in Asia, and they were paying a yearly bill of $30 million just to renew their MATLAB licenses. So this is not always so easy and not always so cheap. Okay, so there are several benchmarks on how to run codes. And actually the benchmarks for Julia code are available online. You can run all of them on their own. You can test it. And actually what happens so on this benchmark, the C language is set to 10 up to power of zero. So it means the C language that is the baseline level. The C language is set, uh, the C language is set to one and other programming languages are relatively being compared to the C language. And what can you see, um, what can you see from this benchmark is that basically Julia for some micro benchmarks is slightly slower from others slightly faster than the code written in C. And this is the fastest of all options. So Python average is around 30 times slower than C. R on average is around 100 times slower than C. So this is, uh, so uh, unless you want to go to other low level languages, 
then basically you every time you sacrifice the performance. And there is also another very similar, uh, and there is also an another very similar uh, ranking. So here we have the programming languages and on the X axis, we have the code length to uh, require to, uh, to achieve a computational goal. At uh, this time, it was an oceanic simulation. I see, oh, here is the reference for the slide. So on the X axis, you have the size of the code to achieve the computational goal. And on the Y axis, you have a runtime compared to C. So C is here. So in C, this code has 10 kilobytes and the runtime value of one. So it was the, so it was the, the fastest. But you can see that up to the Julia was invented, you could either have languages that took really long to program, so that had very long syntax, or you had languages that took very long to execute. And this is exactly the gap that bring, Julia brings. The code can be very uh, concise. So actually you are going to see that there are huge amount of syntactic uh, sugar available in Julia. So the code is uh, short to write, but it is also very fast to execute. So Julia automatically brings two things to one place. We'll see exactly how this is done in a few seconds. But the key features of the language is the performance. So this is dynamically compiled and optimized to native code. We're going to see that in a second. It's scalability. I'm going to talk slide, very shortly on that towards the end of the presentation. So basically it allows uh, the supports for seamed features of processors. So in one clock cycle, you can do perform more than one operation. It fully supports multi-threading. It supports multiprocessing and distributed computing, and this all supported in the language. So if you want to do distributed computing with Julia, you do not need a Hadoop cluster. You do not need a, an installation of Apache Spark. You can just do the things with plain language and just support it inside the language. More on that will also follow. Then the language is based on multiple dispatch. And basically this concept works extremely well when we think about data processing, data science, or mathematical computing. So the model of the language is extremely, extremely efficient and convenient for scientific computing. And it's all free. So it's all open source on the MIT license. Uh, so perhaps the first simple exercise we are going to do is about looking at code compilers. So this is so this is the uh, this is the compila compilation stack. Uh, this is taken um, from Julia tutorial slides. So basically, the process of compiling Julia codes. It's first the first line is parsing, and then the code is being converted to the code understood by something called low-level virtual machine. So this is a set of compilers or that is very popular uh, on uh, Mac OS X ecosystem because the objective C is using this as well. So the code is transferred into the code for low-level virtual machine. And this then it's being compiled to a native code. So let's have a look uh, at an example. So suppose we have a very simple Julia function like this one. So we have a Julia function that is adding two numbers. Mm. We could define it in two ways. We could write function, the name of the function, and then the body of function and end. So you can see this is slight of MATLAB syntax. You do not have curly braces. So many people are used to curly braces and say, hey, I would prefer to use curly braces. But in Julia, Curly braces are using for something else. For defining the block of code, you use the end keyword. Uh, indentation does not matter, like in case of Python, but you need to have the end keyword. So this is a longer, so this is a definition for a multi-line function. If your function fits into la one line, you can also use the definition that looks more or less like a mathematical code. You just write f of x and y equals x plus y. And this is fine as well. And of course, this is a simple function. So I have two, two values here. 
I can just execute it. But now the point is that this function, when it's executed for the first time, it goes through the all compiler process. So actually, if I take this function, I can have a look at a compiled version of this function. So the first, the first is lowering the code. So this is, so this is, uh, so this is uh, preparing the code. Actually, there is one mark, which is called uh, typed, I guess. Okay, so there is one more than there's the information about the types added. Then this is converted into a low level virtual machine code. So this is an intermediate code for the set of compilers. So this is converted into low level virtual machine code. And finally, this is converted to a native code. So actually what you can see here, it's an assembly. This assembly, of course, it's going to look differently depending on the types of arguments. So if I have here 5.8, this leads a different assembly. So you have here some parts of assembly residing in promotion. So because then I'm adding here a floating point number to integer number, or maybe I change that to floating point number, then I get rid of that promotion here. Okay, so you can again see it's a single assembly operation. So this is what's happening with this code. Also, you can see some strange fear in here that starts with at. So what is this at thing? So at is a system of Julia macros. So actually, whenever I write a piece of code, uh, I can decorate with a macro. And macro is a program that runs in compile time and does something interesting with my code. So here I wanted to show the internal process of you know the different stages of compiling my code and macro since macros kick inside the compilation process they can see and display many things and this is how we are um, how we are seeing various uh, how we are seeing various parts uh, we will uh, we will um, we will see those macros slightly later, so I will elaborate uh, still on them. Okay, so this is how the compiler system works. And before moving to introduction to the language, one more thing. Uh, there are many use cases for using this programming language and you can actually find them on the website. There is also one very interesting use case in Poland that I'm going to present tomorrow at quarter past quarter past four during the conference. So this is an optimization of a bicycle factory. Uh, this is one of the major uh, bicycle manufacturers in Europe. And they had a problem of production planning with limited bicycle parts due to COVID. So COVID has struck very strongly the supply chains, as you know, across many, many industries. And this turned out to be a mathematical optimization problem. It, since it's the entire factor with distribution system and many parts and so on, it turned out to be a decision-making prob problems with 4 million parameters and 120 million business constraints. And this was all programmed as a mathematical model. This is also an NP hard if you are interested in computational mathematics. It was all programmed in a mathematical model and solved using Julia programming and a jump library. So we do not have the time to discuss the jump library today, but the tool turned out to be extremely powerful. So we have built an actual mathematical model of a factory and solved it. So actually, the result of this project was increased probability of the factory by 10%. So there was a huge level of probability to increase just thanks to this project. And this is official, officially acknowledged by this bike manufacturing company. Uh, this is also a very big company. They have a capacity of producing 1 million bikes a year. So this was not a small, uh, this was not a small factory, not a small business. 
and this Julia product here was extremely successful transforming business to much higher profitability. More on that will be discussed tomorrow. So about one more thing about learning Julia. So here on the slide, you have the places that probably are good places to start about learning Julia. There is also one additional place which is called Julia Academy. So if you type into Google Julia uh, Academy, so this is one more, okay, I made a typo. Uh, okay, so there is also now a this website specially devoted to learning Julia resources with several tutorials. And as of today, they are all available, uh, all available for free. So this is um, this is another location uh, to learn. Okay, so uh, now we are going to discuss various uh, various uh, parts of language. So Julia is Julia is a type language. So we'll be having type, although it's also a dynamic language and has very interesting mix of how it works. So we'll see that in a minute. So this is a part of type hierarchy for numbers. So uh, so each number has their location. We'll have the look at that in a minute. You can of course convert the data between the types like this um, like this happens in any uh, like it happens in any programming language uh, you can manipulate the types and actually it has been proved that the typing systems in Julia is itself a Turing complete so you could actually be writing a computer program or using all the Julia type system. So let's go to some Julia code. Let's, uh, you know, maybe it's too much of the theoretical part. So here we are constructing a simple vector. So the vector V is a vector having four elements. And you can see now there is a type of V. So the type of V is a vector container having in 64 elements. Okay, so this is this is how we are defining. Uh, this is how we are defining. Uh, this is how uh, how we are defining types. So you have the type of V, but also the type of elements inside V. This is quite very similar to Python NumPy. So if you remember in NumPy, the D type parameter it works. Uh, it works very similar. Now in Julia, you can use comprehension. This is again quite similar to Python. However, there are some differences. Multiplication is optional. So if I have vector of values that is three times X, basically in many places in Julia, you can, uh, in many places in Julia, uh, you can write mathematics, um, you can write mathematics in a way similar that you are be doing in a math book. So this is three X rather than three times X. So you, you can speak, uh, skip multiplication because it's obvious here. For X in, and now we have the ranges. So ranges in Julia work similarly to R, like in Python. You would, the equivalent of Python would be range from one to 10. Okay, so this is their equivalent in Python, but rather than that, uh, in Julia, you have a range, uh, a range uh, defined with a column. And after running this comment, of course, we are ending with a nine element vector. We can check the type of elements of vector. Oh, I think I have not run this code yet. P3. Okay. And we can see that the type of V3 is a vector of in 64. Actually, a vector is a one dimensional array. So this is another thing. So like I told you, uh, the type system is slightly complex in the beginning. We don't have to worry about it, but it says alias for one dimensional array. So I can, of course, task about the element type of this vector. So 
So if I type all type in 64, sorry, uh, V3, then you can see that it's int 64. We can also create an empty vector. So in order to create an empty vector, we just use the type together with square bracket. Just please note that if we create a vector like this, it is also possible, but it has then no type information. So this would be a vector of any. So this is the fir first special type you are seeing. Any type, it means matches anything. This is equivalent into object type in Julia programming language or in C sharp. So we have a type such as object that is matching just anything. And here it's a type any. What is, what is the difference between those two vectors? The first vector, it will be very much more efficiently laid out in memory because it, if you know that all elements are ints, you can use the same type of memory layout you would use in C++ to align elements in your memory. And if you know it's any, you need to do boxing. So this is also something that, for example, Python does for its list. So each element is actually a pointer to an actual object. So it means that processing working with this list will be something like one order of magnitude that is something like 10 times slower than working with this list. So providing typing information counts. So now here we have another example, a complex number. So this is also good to, to show um, how it's being related to additional type information. So you could see that in case of vector, we had a vector of ints. And of course, you, for sure you can have, uh, for, for sure we could have, uh, say a vector of float. So we could do, for example, something like um, it work correctly. Okay. Okay. So this time, again, you can use this nice mathematical syntax. So this is x squared uh, or square root of x. Uh, you can actually, um, you can actually in Julia type, uh, type a LaTeX text, like, like in LaTeX, if, if you know LaTeX. So for example, I could write it as X index one. Okay, you do slash to start the lighting in LaTeX, then you write whatever you want. Okay, so I have now square root of X one for X one in one to nine, and maybe I will call it V. Four. So you can see what is quite nice in case of Julia that you can make your code looking very similar to, you, 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 to what you would have in a mathematics handbook. Okay, in the mathematics handbook. So, uh, and uh, the syntax supports mathematics in many ways. This is very good when, again, you are implementing your own algorithms or you take a research paper because you need to have the most recent data science algorithm and you implement this in Julia. In the meantime, in the meantime, I see I got a question. Uh, I believe this factor optimization, so somebody is asking whether factor optimization problem will be recorded. And the answer is, I think, yes. So I agree about recording it. So as far as I know, Julia organized, uh, the conference organizers uh, plan to uh, record that presentation. And also if somebody, uh, if somebody asked me about slides from this presentation, I mean, the one about bike factor optimization, this is also possible to obtain. Just also don't hesitate to ask questions. So if you, if you have some other questions also don't hesitate to ask. Okay, so we could see that this vector can contain underneath integers or floating values. Okay, but uh, what does it um, uh, what does it uh, even more win mean? We have a syntax. So suppose we have a complex number like here. It's complex one point four. So the type of this number is complex defined in the space of int 
64 numbers. I could define a complex number over a, another real number space and this time on floating point 64 numbers. And then the type of C2 is complex float 64, which is an alias for complex of 64 numbers. Uh, I could also implement another type. So suppose I'm, so suppose either I would like to have a complex number in the space of 32 bit numbers. Uh, and sorry, I used the wrong parentheses. And also I can do it. Okay, so now I have a complex number. If I type um, type of C2, so this time I have a complex numbers defined in the space of floats 32 bit numbers. So this is actually very powerful. Uh, this is actually a very powerful mechanism because you can uh, because you can. Uh, because you can, uh, because you can uh, now, uh, uh, you can now use any number space. If you have a concept of floating point number, then you could mm, do, you could define it over uh, you could define it over a uh, number space. Uh, so maybe we could have something like let's call it C three. Uh, okay, and okay, so now this time I have a complex number defined in the space of rational numbers. So if I have a rational number arithmetic, so this is one fourth, of course. So if I have a rational number ar arithmetic, then I can have a complex number defined in the space of rational numbers. But my space of rational numbers is defining over integer numbers. But I can also have rational. I could also have. Um, I could also have rational space uh, numbers defined. No, not over float, but say say over some different space of numbers. So this could be, for example, rational over int thirty two, or maybe I have very big numbers and I need int one hundred twenty eight. I'm not sure if it's yeah it's supported. Uh, it's supported out of the box. There are also Julia libraries that allow you to define biggest, bigger numbers over more than 128 bits. So by default, 256 wouldn't work, but there is a library for it. So you can see that this type mechanism is very, is, is very powerful because we have a mathematical definition of something that is a complex number. And then we can apply this complex number often over many number spaces. And this number space, some of those number spaces like space for rational numbers are also parameterized. Uh, it results in very powerful po uh, possibilities. And this all gets compiled to native assembly. So it's very powerful, but it also results in very fast code. So we have those data types. Uh, so there are some examples of what we can do with those data bytes of, we have a floating point number as a string, so we can parse it. So this is not surprising. We have a function of one and zero for any number system. So again, uh, this returns one of float 64, this returns zero of int, but maybe I would rather prepare prepare fair to have a zero of unsigned int on defined on 30 bits. So this is all available. So I'm just saying what type of number as I want and I can get it. Now here are some basic type conversions. So you can have a look. So you can see here, I'm using this show function. So it might require a comment. So again, this thing show is a macro. So what does the macro do? It takes the code and builds a some piece of code around it. <coughs> so it behaves the way we want to. So here it says boolean one equals true. Uh, I'm using a semicolon here at the end 
to suppress the output because otherwise also bool one this true is being output to the call console in julia if you press a semicolon at the end of the line you suppress the output so i told you it's a macro so what is a macro macro is a piece of julia program that kicks in the compile time so actually i could do something like this add macro expand this is another macro and this macro says, hey, this is a code, but expand all the macros to codes. So if I run this, I can actually see what the show function doing. It's making a source code transformation. So the show function is doing a println function. It places whatever code was, was there and, and does the computation here. It does the computation and re, uh, returns the value. So all what macro da, or all what the macros do, they take a piece of source code then an argument and produce another source code. And this all happening in the compile time. This is a very powerful feature of the language because it allows to us to add in many surprising places, very interesting syntactic sugar or capabilities to the, um, or capabilities to the, uh, to the code. Okay, we have more on types. So integer is a subtype of any, so this means and subtype of something. Integer is a subtype of type union of int and float 64. There is also a special value similar to null in other programming languages, which is called nothing. There is also missing in Julia, by the way. And the type of nothing, it's nothing. Nothing is also, it's, it's also a singleton value. So there is only one object of nothing. And this object is of type nothing. Okay. <clears throat> when there's nothing happening, for example, let's have consider a function f of f from x that is just printing the x. And yeah, so I can even do something like x equals x. Mm, Julia is using interpolation like r. So you can, in this way, you can interpolate a variable uh, inside of a string. Okay, and when I run it, it says x equals one because it got interpolated, but this function, so it's only printing, it's returning a value nothing, which I'm not seeing in the console, but the value nothing is of type nothing. So nothing is up, uh, one case of nothing is when nothing is uh, returned. Now we have tuples. So tuples in Julia work very similar to Python. So I assume all of you know Python, so I'm not going to discuss it, but there is a maybe one important thing. If you create a tuple like this one, tuples are typed. So in Python, a tuple is a containers that can have elements of any type, but nobody cares what is the type of elements. And in Julia, tuples are strictly typed. So if I make a tuple like free and free dot zero, it says the type of this tuple is a tuple where first element is integer and the second element is a floating point number. Similarly, if I have a tuple say k, y, um, k and maybe let me put a rational number at the end, so one, one, one fifth. So then I have a tuple of three elements when the first element is integer, the second element is string, and the third element is a rational number. Okay, so we did it. So this is how tuples, uh, this is uh, how, uh, this is how uh, the, um, tuples uh, work. Uh, this is the, the next thing, now the matrices. So matrices, Again, uh, a matrices again work. Um, matrices again uh, work similar to other languages. Uh, now, what is interesting? So, in order to define a matrix or an array, you can write something like, say, matrix in sixty-four. And then I can, in Julia, I can say, just give me a part of memory 
So take a part of operating system memory and give me it as a matrix. So have a look at this code. So what is, so let me mark this matrix by Y. So what is this? It takes any part of L available memory and gives me it a matrix and it's uninitialized. So it can have any rubbish that was previously in the memory. So any data that was in the part of memory that now has been assigned to Y, I'm seeing it here. So what does it mean that, for example, if I do need to do some matrix processing, I do not always need to fill it with zeros. Of course, we have in Julia a zeros function very similar to zeros function in NumPy. Again, it's all similar. And we can, we can create, uh, we can create say an array of zeros. Now, when we create an array, when we create an array, what you need to know, what you need to know is that in Julia arrays, contrary to say NumPy, are use one-based numbering. So suppose we have an array like this, and we want to set an element in the array. So I can write here something like, here's my matrix, first row and third column set the volume 64, 66. Uh, my, val uh, my matrix was actually a matrix of floats. Uh, I, I could say at this far parameter, I want to have a matrix of ints. It would work like this. If I do not provide the first parameter, it's a matrix of floats. So the 66 uh, integer value got converted to a float value, but here you can see, hey, this value has been set here. So this is how it works. Now, Julia is using one-based numbering, okay? One-based numbering. So this is big difference um, uh, between um, Python. In Python, also, also in JavaScript, uh, in Java, in C, in C Sharp, in C, and in many programming languages, zero-based numbering is used. So if you are moving from NumPy to Julia, so this is one thing you need to remember. So this is one-based numbering. So the first numbers, so the first element of anything starts with one. This is similar to languages like R, MATLAB, and basically mathematics. So in mathematics, we use, of course, one-based numbering. And this decision was made in the language to look mathematical expressions in Julia more like in, like in a textbook. So this language is really good for implementation of algorithms. So once you get used to one-based numbering, you are much less likely to make an error when implementing some code, you know, some new algorithms, some new data science approaches, because they are usually defined using the mathematical language. In Julia, you have array slicing. This is very similar to what you would have in, uh, what, this is very similar to what you would have in uh, NumPy. It has a reshape function, very similar to NumPy, although you need to notice that if I do something like A equals reshape varies from one to 12 and three by four, I'm actually not getting a matrix but rather, um, rather than that, I'm getting a reshape element. So Julia is actually clever enough to know that these are the values from one to 12 start in three by four layout. So what does it mean in practice? So suppose I have a matrix that has 12 billion elements, of course, I do not have that much memory in my machine. And now the question is, do I just now run out of memory and finish this demo and get disconnected? So let's go, let's see what's going to happen. No, Julia is clever enough to understand that these are the values from one up to 12 billion just put into a matrix structure. So it does not materialize the data. And actually this is another thing Julia is very good at. I do not have that much space in my memory, but Julia, rather than holding in memory 12 billion values, which would require 
roughly these are uh, int values, so it would require roughly 100 gigabytes of RAM memory. Instead of holding all, holding all those um, 12 billion values, rather it has the information that these are numbers from 1 to 12 billion, given this kind of shape. So this information is held in the type of the variable. This is very strong because uh, in some scenarios you can do mathematical processing without actually revolting to any very single number. Okay, so this is so this is uh, so this is uh, how it works. Here are more examples on array slicing, and probably uh, these are again very similar to what you would find in uh, NumPy with the exception that the numbering starts with one. So you need to learn leave it with it. So one up to two, it means so A, all rows. So this way you define all rows like num NumPy and columns from one to two. So it means it takes the first and the second column. Uh, we could also write something like columns from three to end. So in case of NumPy, you would leave an open end. You would write it like this. In case of Julia, you need to rather write something from free to end, and this is up to the last element. So the last, so you do not omit the last element in a range when doing um, array slicing in Julia, rather than that you use an end. So sorry for referring to Python so many times, but assume that this is some technology that that the attendees of this workshop might know. So now we have the data structures. So here is a discussion of some very basic data structures. So we have structs. Okay, so in Julia we have structs. A struct defines any data structure. This works very similar like an object in Python, although methods need to be placed outside of an object. So imagine an object-oriented mechanism where methods are not placed inside the objects, but rather than outside of them. Otherwise, it's quite similar the, to object-oriented programming, but in the end, it's usually the typical layout of Julia code is using the multi-dispatch paradigm rather than object-oriented paradigm, so the philosophy of library is often, is often in the end different. But if you think about something like objects, in Julia you have structs. Each element in the struct, okay, so the struct can be either mutable or immutable. If I do not put the word mutable, it, I end up having an immutable struct and I get an error because here in the code I'm trying to change the value of uh, of p, I'm trying to say, write p dot meta equals two, and I'm failing doing this because now it's not mutable. I have to go back to the mutable one. Okay, now I have problem because it says, hey, you cannot redefine this type, so I will name it differently. So this time it will be point one. Okay, so this is so this is uh, so this is uh, so this is how it works. So, uh, so this is my um, this is my type. I can also ask about what elements a type consists. So, if I have object P, I can ask what is the type of object P, and see what the fields are inside. If I want to ever display any Julia object, you have a special command that is named dump, which basically dumps shows everything what is inside an object. This is very convenient when you do not have your own method to display an object. So dump p is displaying all the properties of p. I can ask about field names. Uh, actually, you are seeing those strange things in columns. These are all columns. These are also Julia structures. These Julia data structures are called symbols. And you can also show any symbol. So here I'm writing dump. Dump is a kind of low level show dump A, and I can see that A is actually a type symbol A. Okay, so these are symbols. They are very useful in uh, metaprogramming, that is writing software, that, uh, that's writing code, that is reprocessing the code. So these were those macros that I've mentioned. 
but also uh, but also there are uh, those symbols are also being used as identifier as identifiers of columns and data uh, if i want if i want to have default values i need to use a macro and this macro this macro is called with uh, with uh, kw is extending the julia syntax by possibility of adding default values for so by default i cannot have a uh, by standard i cannot have a default value i cannot write x equals four because uh, it's not supported in the language but it's supported when i say hey this is a, this is a configurable piece of piece of code i want to be able uh, to manage the default values and then i'm saying mutable struct point and then i can set uh, and i can set the uh, the default values uh, so it would I, I think i need to have a different names this time point 3 maybe Okay, it complains because I've defined point as something else. And I cannot just redefine types because it's a compiled language. Okay, uh, so I could write here something like point three at x equals 11 uh, meta equals ss. And you can see I'm, I'm getting an object like this. So here I'm assigning new values and Y is using the old value that was assigned in constructor. So it works, it works all as expected. Then we have dictionaries. Dictionaries in Julia work like dictionaries in Python with the exception that they are all typed. So here I'm defining a dictionary where the type of keys is integers and the type of values is a float 64. And this builds me a dictionary. And here it's an empty dictionary, okay? So I'm defining an empty dictionary. Then I can put elements into that dictionary. And yes, here we are seeing the elements. Here we are seeing the elements of, in our dictionary. In case of Python, the, the difference between Julia and Python is that in case of Python, we would be having really their dictionary that any object can be key and any object can be value. So they are not typed. So this is uh, this is uh, this is the reason. This is the difference between this is the difference. Uh, this is the difference between uh, Julia and Python, but in Python, you do not have types of elements in dictionaries and here they are typed. Why this typing information is so important? Because it can allow the Julia compiler to specialize the code. Like you remember, I told you at the beginning, Julia is compiling its code to assembly and this is only possible because of the typing information. So that's why, uh, that's why it, uh, it can work. Again, we have all standard comments to manipulate dictionaries like in any programming language. So we have adding elements, deleting elements and so on. Uh, so, this is, so this is easy and probably does not require a big discussion. Then we have text processing. So one thing that is uh, so, Everything what is standard in language you might expect. So you have uh, full support for regular expressions. You define a regular expression, putting R in front of a string. So this is a text macro. This is also available in Python, a similar mechanism. And you can define a, a regular expression to matching and so on. One thing that is particularly interesting is the interpolation mechanism. So suppose you have a value X and it's say uh, six, okay? And we, we want to have some text and we say, hello. And in this way, using the dollar sign, we can interpolate, we can place any variable inside the text. So this is the way to interpolate variables. But on the, not only that, if we use the parentheses, we can also interpolate any expression inside a text. This is similar to a mechanism present in languages like in Per, in Ba or Bash. 
So probably not many data scientists know the Perl programming language, but I guess most of you have been using Bash. And so this is quite, uh, so this is a quite similar, uh, similar mechanism to how you can interpolate parameters in Bash. It's very convenient because when you, uh, of course it's possible to concatenate strings, but placing variables inside strings is usually, is usually just, uh, you know, just nicer. Uh, okay. If you use like Windows paths and you do not do want to turn out character escaping, so it's using character escaping like any programming language, but if you want to turn it off and say that slash n is not a new line, but just slash n, then you can simply do it by adding a row. This is called a text macro. You can add a row text decorator to your string. By the way, it's quite interesting. You can adjust a Julia macro and you can define your own Julia macros that do different uh, interesting things in uh, with string. So basically everything in Julia is programmed in Julia. Uh, and it also means that any function letter you see, you can, it can also be further implemented or extended with, with Julia. Then we have functions. So as you can see, this is a very fast demo of the language. If you have patience and time to listen to this presentation, you will have very compressed knowledge of what's going on here. So now we have functions. So any, any function, uh, any function is, mm, uh, any, any function is, uh, can be defined either as fx equals and something. You can use also the more complex form that we have a g function and we return some arguments. So we have a return keywords. Mm. Now uh, we, can, uh, we can have the same function with different parameter, um, we can have the same function with different parameter set. So just, you know, to, to make some focus, I would just, um, uh, I will just, uh, where do I, where I accidentally deleted it. So I should be able to undo it and delete cells wanted to add a cell. Okay, so when we have a function like this, you, you can have many version of functions. So the same function names can be used with different parameters. And the different parameters types are going to result in different functions. So now I can write at show g from one and two, and then I'm going to get a tuple of elements one and two. And if I write uh, show G one and true, those two elements get multiplicated by each other. So I'm going to get the value one. Okay, so different versions of the functions are going to be called depending on the parameter types. And this is, uh, this is quite basic construct. For any function, you can list its methods. So you can see that the G function has two methods. Of course, there are functions that have really lots of methods. So if we show methods for print function, it actually can, um, can support really a huge number of parameter combinations and types. Okay, but you can you can define uh, you can define it on your own. Then we have the operators. So again, a very a, a very long list uh, a, a very long list of operator. So, uh, like you again, you might expect in an operator uh, uh, language. So we have the logic operators and so on. But there is one thing that is specific to Julia programming language, and this is very powerful, and this is called operator or function of um, broadcasting. So suppose you have the following function. 
if f from x and y, if x is lower than y, it returns x, otherwise it's returning y. Of course, so it's returning the smaller of both numbers. Uh, so of course, uh, if you have two numbers well, like one and two, or maybe 10 and 30, you can see, oh, I did not redefine the function once again. So if, if you have f from x and y for two numbers and 10 and 30, it's returning the smaller of those two numbers. So this is quite obvious. Now, suppose you want to run this f function over a vector of values. So suppose I have two vectors, a it's one, two, three, and b it's zero, five, six. And I would like to, for each pair of matching values, I would like to get a lower of them. In Python, probably I would be using a comprehension uh, or some, I would be probably need to write a loop. Basically in most programming languages, you would need to write a loop to process that. Fortunately, not in Julia. Julia has a special dot operator and dot per operator is a magic. It makes anything of, you can think of to work on vectors. Uh, so, I have those two vectors here. And if I do f dot a and b, then the function f will be called for each pair of those elements iteratively. So this single dot is replacing the full, uh, the full for loop. It can be used in many scenarios. So if I want to multiply, a times B, I get an error because they are both vectors. And in mathematical algebra, it's not defined how to multiply vectors. I could, of course, if I mean that, I could transpose A and multiply it, transpose A times B, then I have something that is called the dot product of those vectors. But suppose I want to multiply this element, uh, those two vectors element wise, how we can do it? Do I need to write a loop? No, in Julia, we do not need to write a loop. We can vectorize, so we add a dot. So dot is an explicit vectorization operation. So whenever you have any, uh, any operator, and you can also in Julia define your custom operators, by the way, when you have any operator on any Julia function, when, and you need to write a full loop, introduce a new variable and so on. Instead of doing that, in Julia, you can just type one character and this is dot, and then it works on vectors. This is extremely helpful when you are writing mathematical codes, because in mathematical codes, usually you have some arrays or matrices, and you know, you want just to perform operations on elements, on matching elements of two vectors, uh, or to matrices and not to spend lots of time by writing all those loops, which just kills the readability of the code. So this is, um, uh, so this is kind of a very powerful mechanism. Uh, here is one small demo about the typing system showing it, its capabilities. Uh, so this is using, using various number system to calculate pi number. Uh, so you can, uh, you can have a log because we do, not have, uh, we, we do not have time to discuss it. But for example, here is the P number represented by various rational, uh, 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 rational, uh, 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 rational um, values. So you can have a look at the code, how it works. Uh, there is also actually in Julia, a special number P. Okay, it looks like this. So you type it slash pi like in LaTeX slash pi and it's types and you press tab to get P. Uh, the type of it's irrational and it's 3.14, blah, 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 blah. So this is, this is how it, so Julia supports not only rational number, but irrational numbers. And here I'm playing with it. So you can see it after the lecture. 
Julia offers an excellent integration with other programming languages. So actually you can, uh, I have shown you the one with R, it will be more on that in a minute, but actually in Julia, you can also load a uh, Python package. So you have a special model called PyCall. And for example, here in Julia, I'm loading NumPy. So you know NumPy, probably doesn't make sense to use NumPy from Julia, but in the same way, any Python library can be loaded to Julia and being used directly. So this is a NumPy module loaded into Julia. And I can do numpy dot zeros, the size of zeros D type, and this is the data type known by numpy. And if I now show A, A has been cast back to Julia and it's Julia type int 32. So actually I got a handout of this memory that is storing those zeros from NumPy and now they are available They are available to me in Julia. I can of course mutate elements on the mutated element I can call. So this is, you know, you have seen that A is, so maybe I just put it still like this. So A is a Julia object, uh, but I can perform on this Julia object operation like mutate it and then again call a NumPy method. So you can back and forth integration into NumPy and any Python module can be used in Julia. In practice, Python has great plotting functionality and it's being used by Julia. This is another piece of Python code. So here I'm using a comprehension mechanism to generate, um, to generate a dictionary, uh, to the generate a dictionary. So you can see this is a Python dictionary and when it's called, it's available as a Julia dictionary. So basically you can mix Julia and Python code. You can also mix Julia and R code. And I have shown you that when talking about the command line. Mm, so here is a short example. Uh, here is a short example of a code that it's loading ggplot2 library uh, into um, that is loading ggplot2 library into Julia. Uh, I'm creating here, uh, so I'm creating here a set of random numbers and making them to a data frame. So unfortunately, we do not have time to discuss data frames. Julia has very powerful data frame functionality, much more convenient than what you have, for example, in pandas. Okay, so this is, I'm generating here a data frame. And so this is a data frame. This data frame has two columns. And now I can use R to plot that data. So actually this MV normal, it stands for multivariate normal. So I have generated random numbers from the multivariate normal distribution, 1000 of those numbers. I got them as a matrix, and then I have trans transferred the matrix to a data frame. This is the data frame. And then I'm using ggplot for R to plot that data frame. And you can see that this is an actual syntax. Uh, this is an actual syntax from ggplot with the exception that to make it too much Julia in ggplot you would write here equals x1 and in Julia I need to at, I need to uh, uh, modify it to symbols, but I, I can plot it. There is also another way to plot it. There is a string macro R, and basically you can put any R code near the R macro. And again, I'm using here ggplot, but then I need to send the data frame from Julia to R, and you do it also by interpolation. So I have been showing you text interpolation, uh, so also when you are interfacing with other programming languages, uh, you have uh, you have similar interpolation. So you can see I can call I can call R code from Julia in just you know in just transparent way. When do I call Python and R in Julia? Probably when I want to do some plotting. So this is this is. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is the case. 
Now, another thing Julia is very strong as is about symbolic computing. So Julia has very powerful compiler system and this compiler system can also work on symbolic code. And here is an example. So maybe I'm not sure if I have calculus installed. If not, let's just do it. So this time I'm going to use uh, Visual Studio Code. So you do not have all time, all the examples in Julia. Okay, so I need to load the calculus package. I'm not, so uh, in case of Visual Studio Code, you press Control Enter, uh, you press Control Enter to run the current line. Mm. So it has, it says I do not have the calculus, so I can use the Julia package manager to add that package. Okay, so I'm, now I'm using the Julia package manager to install uh, to install a Julia package that I didn't uh, that I didn't uh, that I didn't have this time. Uh, so it's pulling the list of packages in the registry, and it's going to get installed. Uh, it's going to get installed very soon. Uh, so what it can do? So Julia uh, Julia makes it possible to differentiate a source code. So actually, if suppose you are, you, are, uh, you are doing your new deep neural network. If you want to design your own functions, and of course, when you are optimizing the parameters of a deep neural network, you need to differentiate code. In case in Julia, any function in Julia can be differentiated numeric uh, symbolically. So you do not need to numerically differentiate anything. It can be done symbolically. So my calculus package got installed in the meantime. So let me let me let me just show how it's going to work. I need to exit the package manager mode. Now I can press Control and Enter, and then I can do differentiate. So and when I differentiate this piece of code, sinus x, it's then it's cosine x, okay? But it can work. Uh, it can work also on a very large, um, bigger code basis. But since Julia, Julia's code is represented into Julia, and we have this macro system, this is called meta programming. Uh, actually, there are Julia packages that are capable of differentiating and processing Julia uh, Julia code in uh, in runtime. Uh, okay, so you have symbolic computing, and many packages in many scenarios can do that automatically. Uh, now the next thing, so this is as you can see overview, we are running out of time. So it's planned for something like 90 minutes so the eight minutes left. So the next thing where Julia is extremely strong is parallel and distributed computing. So Julia programs can run on clusters. So personally, I have been running a single Julia program on a Cray supercomputer on 8,000 CPU cores. So it is possible to write a program in Julia and have one program to run on say 40 machines and 8,000 computing cores and it just works. Actually, Julia is known to run on the biggest supercomputers in the world. There is a project named Celeste about mapping the entire visible universe and it was recently ported to Julia. This is one of top three supercomputers, I guess, as of today. So what models are supported? So SIMD, this is a kind of free range parallelism. Sometimes in a single cycle of clock, you can perform many operations and you can control that from Julia. You have green threads and similar are available in Python. You have a native multi-threading and this is defined in two levels. It's available in the language and also some libraries are multi-threaded. And you have multi-processing. So you can run many Julia processes at the same time. And this includes a single machine and a cluster uh, and also a cluster. So it can be a group of machines. Also, you can ask other softwares to provide 
processes to Julia cluster. This, this happens in case of supercomputing environments when you have supercomputing uh, supervisors and you can ask supervisors, hey, give me a few Julia processes to the cluster. So it's all very powerful. Uh, so the first thing is single instruction multiple data. So suppose I have a same very simple Julia function that calculates a dot product of something. So in order, uh, the macro inbound terms of bound checking. So I know that X and Y, assuming that they have the exact the same length, I'm not doing an assertion here this time. Uh, assuming that I know they are the good length, I can turn off the bound checking and just do adding and multiplication. Now, if I add here just at seemed, this code will get compiled differently. So I'm going to get a different piece of assembly for the second case. And this code will be much faster. So actually, uh, so actually the second, the second code, uh, okay, maybe I can, no, we do not have time to run, but the second code is about four up to six times faster. Now, in case of real, par in case of standard parallelism, mm, Julia supports, uh, when you start Julia via command line, you have options for multi-threading, multi-processing and distributed computing. So basically it works like this, that when I spawn Julia and I say Julia minus T8, I will run Julia with eight threads, or I could do ju ju Julia minus P4. It means that I spawning five Julia processes with one comment. I'm spawning one master and four slaves. To make it even nicer, this, so I, I can actually see them if I type using distributed. So I can see those slaves, they are called workers. So I have four workers. I have four slave processes attached to the master. Actually, I have a comment that is named at prox. And this comment can be used to add additional processes to my Julia cluster. And what it makes it really exciting, those processes can be on the same machine or they can be on remote machines. So you can very simply build a Julia cluster. Uh, similarly, there is a parameter minus minus machine file. You can provide it when launching Julia and again, start a Julia cluster. You do not have Hadoop, you do not have Slarm, it's, uh, you do you do not uh, you do not have had you do not have um, Apache Spark. It's all inside the programming language. So then it's also then it's also beautifully supported. And so multi-threading. So the simplest way to multi-thread a loop is by using um, is by using a macro decorator. So in Julia, all those difficult topics are being solved with macro decorators. So let me go to my the Visual Studio code. So uh, if I type here threads dot and threads, I can see that my Julia at Visual Studio code is running using four threads. So it's configured to run four threads. So let me let me try let me uh, let me try to run the simple function. So this is just uh, this is just using for benchmark. Just to recall, all the um, all the slides are available online, so you can you can download them anytime you want. Okay, so this is uh, so this is a very simple function, and the second version, the only difference it it has a multi-threading decorator and say, hey, I want to run this, uh, I want to run this uh, loop in, uh, I want to run this loop in uh, multiple, uh, multi triple threads. Of course, I could also ask about a threading number and so on, but this is just, mm, this is just very simple loops calculating the sum. Uh, so let me, uh, let me try to run it. So I just, mark this code and press control enter. And then I have the value of X. 
So X is uh, 10,000, uh, X is a 10,000 random number. Now um, I have, we have a special package for benchmarking Julia code. This is called um, benchmark tools. And it has a macro named benchmark. Uh, so uh, let me try to benchmark the first code. And I interpolate the value X here. Mm. Uh, sorry, X needed to be, I think, two dimensional because it was calculating columnar sum. So I did it wrong. Okay, so it's my X once again. So I'm benchmarking, uh, I'm benchmarking uh, for the first function. And then so benchmark runs it several times. So it takes a few seconds. And I'm benchmarking for the second, for the multi-threaded, um, for the multi-threaded, uh, for the multi-threaded function. And then I should be then I should be getting the results, and you can see that uh, that the typical runtime it's so. Let's have a look at the minimum. The minimum runtime for the first function is four hundred milliseconds, and uh, sorry for the second function for the multi-threaded function is four hundred milliseconds, and for the first function is one second. And maybe those benchmarks are too long. If you want a shorter one, just a small information about time, we could rather write at B time. Because you can see this shows with all the graphs and statistics. So the Julia community is actually extremely obsessed about speed. So people in Julia community are benchmarking everything and proposing all the time new things, new ways to, uh, new ways to, do, uh, to do things faster. Uh, but you can see it's so this one was 1.8 milliseconds and this is this one will be once it completes around uh, around oh here yeah, it is uh, 370 milliseconds okay so this is how it works so you have very simple paradigms to implement there are of course locking mechanisms so threads means locking so you have various types of locking mechanisms we have don't do not have time uh, to discuss it now you have a very simple pattern to write a distributed loop. So suppose that I have a piece of code that I want to run over many workers. So this here code here is generating a, a data frame. So let me just load here the data frame package. So this is this machine when I had four workers, okay, for, for processes. So I'm loading here the data frames package because I will be using workers to generate data frame. Also, I actually need to load this package everywhere in the cluster. So everywhere means load a package in all workers across the cluster. So now I can run this very simple code. It's just, it's just generating random numbers, but the point is, that random numbers are being generated independently in each worker of the, in, of the data frame. And let me run it once again so it will be more clearly visible. So this piece of code returns a data frame when here I have an ID of a node that performed a particular part of computation. And I see this line was calculated in the node two. This one was calculated in the node three. This one was calculated in the process four and so on and, and, and process five. Because as you can remember, we had, uh, we had for workers. So these were workers two, three, four, five, and each of these workers has performed part of the job. And so this is how you can do distributed computing. There are of course plenty of other methods how you can accomplish it. So, um, so those, those methods are also available in the language. Uh, we do not, have, do not have the exact time to discuss. So for today, we are coming, uh, so we are coming towards the end of this presentation because 
uh, this is uh, this is the end of the plant time. But if you are interested in Julia training and it can be on site or it can be online, then just let me know. This is this is what I'm doing from time to time. So if you are interested in a Julia training, don't hesitate to contact me. If you are interested, if you are looking for venture capital for your startup, this is another thing what I'm doing among many things that I do. Uh, this is this is also another story. Tomorrow I will be then presenting yet another area on how to run a large scale optimization model. So there will be a use case scenario on large scale um, optimization. I'm easy to find via Google. Just type my name to the Google. You find my website. You find my company website. All contacts. So if you want to if you want to reach me, if you are more interested in this programming language, just let me know. Uh, for today, that is all. The materials are the materials are available online. As you can see, the language is very powerful. This was just only a short overview. Of course, there are many other materials you can reach for. Perhaps one of uh, one of also another places to further learn Julia is this uh, Julia Academy website. Or if you are interested in a custom-made training for your organizations, let me know. Thank you very much for this attending this presentation and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Przemyslav, for your presentation and tech tutorial. Uh, I just wanted to say that it was a lovely day of tech tutorials. I want to thank you for accepting to be a technical tutor here at the conference. This is it for today's technical tutorials. And we will see you tomorrow at the at the program part of the conference with talks. So take care and have a good day. <laughs>